Uh, I will be sending this link to all participants, all registrants. We'll also be posting it online later as well. So you can watch this at a later time, whether you missed part of it or want to share it with others or even want to watch it again. All right, folks, we're going to transition into another room area right now, and that's when you'll be able to see uh, me and John on camera. So I'm going to start my webcam here. And actually, John, I'm going to inc um, invite you to do the same as well. Good morning, everybody. And uh, while John is turning everything on, I'm just going to give a couple more reminders of how this thing all works today. First off, uh, below me, you should see the, this Q&A pod. And it's a little different than the chat that we worked on uh, earlier. Uh, there's John. There we go. Now we can see it, John. <laughs> hey there. But below us is this Q&A pod. And uh, that Q&A pod is where you type in questions for John throughout the program. What I will be doing is I'm going to be looking all the questions that I see and then after uh, John's presentation is over uh, we will be um, going back and forth with those questions that you ask so I will be asking as your proxy essentially now uh, I want to spend a little bit of time before I officially turn it over to, of course, introduce our honored and our special guest today, uh, Mr. Jonathan Parshall. And I'm going to read your bio, if you don't mind, at least the one that we use here at the museum. So, uh, Jonathan Parshall saw his interest in the Imperial Japanese Navy develop early in his childhood. As an adult, that passion had led him to write for the Naval War College Review, the U.S. Naval Institute's Proceedings Magazine, and World War II Magazine. Parshall's book, Shattered Sword, The Untold Story of the Battle of Midway, which he co-authored with Anthony Tully, is seen as the definitive account of the pivotal battle in the Pacific. A graduate of Carleton College and the Carlson School of Management, Parshall is currently working on a history of the year of 1942 and how the Allies transformed themselves to meet their respective challenges during that year. And as you heard, uh, Mr. Parshall here will also be going on uh, our 75th anniversary tour. So I think I saw some folks, actually, they're going on the tour, right? So uh, you'll be seeing him later. Well, uh, John, then I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to pause my video and audio, but I will be behind the scenes writing down everybody's great questions to ask you later. So everybody, uh, give a warm virtual welcome to Jonathan Parshall. Thank you for joining us today. All right. And hopefully everybody can hear me at this point. I'm seeing a little active microphone sign on my end, so I'm assuming we're all good. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for being here this morning. And uh, uh, some of you may know I, I wrote a book on the Battle of Midway a number of years ago, but I'm very interested in early war carrier operations in general and, frankly, the whole early period of the war, uh, 1942 and uh, 41. So, and I also will be in Hawaii, uh, as Chrissy mentioned. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I was one of the historians on the tour there last year, and it was a great time. We really had a, had a wonderful time and learned a lot. So I'm looking forward to meeting anyone who's here on the webinar this morning uh, out in Hawaii. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, mostly from the Japanese perspective. And uh, I want to cover three things, if I can figure out how to advance the slides here. There we go. First thing I want to cover is talking a little bit about how the Japanese carrier force was formed uh, during the lead up to the attack. This is a very dynamic uh, time period and it's, and it's still relatively poorly understood, uh, but I want to cover some of the basics there. Then I want to go to uh, an overview of the attack itself, first the, the planning aspects of the attack and then how the attack was actually executed and how do those two things match up. Because a lot of people look at Pearl Harbor and it's, it's sort of commonly portrayed as this brilliantly conceived, brilliantly executed, you know, almost textbook attack. And I'd like to put some caveats around that. Then I want to talk a little bit about what I think is the most pernicious myth around the whole Pearl Harbor attack, which is this notion that the Japanese could have or would have come back 
um, and attacked the fuel tank farm at Pearl Harbor, that they were even considering such a thing. Um, so we're going to dive into that a little bit. And then I want to wrap all of those strands up uh, in sort of a, a global reinterpretation of the operation itself. So without further ado, uh, creating the Japanese Carrier Task Force. You have to remember that at this point in time, um, we're talking mid-1941, the aircraft carrier was still sort of the wild west of naval weapon systems. It was not uh, a mature technology in the sense that the battleship was by this time. Big deck carriers had only been around since about 1928, so they were, you know, 13 years old or thereabouts. And people were still trying to get their their heads and their hands around how are these things actually going to operate in a war because no one had ever fought a war with an aircraft carrier before. So in the Western navies, the Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy, carriers at this time were viewed primarily as scouting assets. They were appended to the main battle line of battleships, and their job was to operate in onesies, twosies, find the other guys' battleships, um, perhaps uh, operate as spotting assets to correct gunfire uh, and that sort of thing, and, and that was really kind of their role. That was starting to change in the Western navies, and you see indications of that, for instance, uh, in the British attack against Taranto um, in the Mediterranean in 1940. Um, but at this point in time, uh, carriers are still seen as, as operating kind of solo. Meanwhile, uh, on the other side of the pond, um, in Japan, some of the air power visionaries there were starting to have a different idea, which was uh, around multi-carrier operations. How could we use these animals uh, together to create strategically meaningful uh, results on the battlefield? And the driver for this process was not actually Admiral Yamamoto, although uh, Yamamoto, in his role as Commander-in-Chief of Combined Fleet and also the architect of the Pearl Harbor attack as a whole, um, he was an air power advocate, but he was not the guy behind uh, creating a unified carrier fleet. Uh, the people behind that were actually the gentleman on the left here, uh, Commander Minoru Genda, who was uh, an early uh, well-known fighter pilot, ace, uh, and, a, and a real air power advocate within the Navy. He started militating for the creation of this uh, unified carrier fleet, and actually he got the idea from the Americans. Um, he says in his autobiography that he was watching a, a movie reel uh, that started out with uh, one of those five-minute movie tone news clips, and it had a view of all four of the big American carriers at the time, Lexington, Saratoga, Yorktown, and Enterprise, in a box formation. And the Americans had put that together purely for uh, PR purposes. You know, it made a nice-looking movie clip. Genda looked at that, and he was like, huh, you know, I wonder if we could actually operate carriers together and bring big groups of aircraft to the battlefield. What could we do? with that sort of an agglomeration of naval air power. And so he started agitating sort of from the bottom up, uh, but he had the kind of personal status and reputation that he could do that sort of thing. And he started talking to other friends within the Navy, uh, one of whom was Vice Admiral uh, Jisaburo Ozawa. Um, and Ozawa uh, became enamored of this idea and began pushing Yamamoto on it and eventually went to Yamamoto and said, you know, um, I think we really have to do this thing, and if you're not going to push the button on this, I'm going to go over your head and start talking to the Navy minister about it. At which point Yamamoto was like, fine, fine. Um, because, of course, Yamamoto was thinking at this time, this is April of 1941, uh, he's already starting to think about launching an attack against Pearl Harbor. So on April 1st, 1941, the orders were cut to create uh, an administrative unit called the First Air Fleet. Uh, which would have a tactical manifestation called the Kido Butai, uh, which means mobile force or striking force in Japanese. So what that order did was it took the four big flight decks in the Japanese Navy, Carrier Division 1 of Akagi and Kaga, and Carrier Division 2 of Soryu and Hiryu, and put them all together into one tactical unit. And during the lead up to Pearl Harbor, uh, during the fall of 1941, Carrier Division 5 uh, of Shokaku and Zuikaku would then be added to this mix as they were launched and commissioned. So here is Carrier Division 1. These are the two oldest carriers uh, in the Japanese Navy, Kagi and Kaga. And Carrier Division 2 
groups or you'd hear you slightly smaller based on heavy cruiser hulls but uh, very fast and useful and then carrier division 5 of shokaku and zuikaku arguably some of the nicest uh, some of the finest carriers that, that were used during the entire war so it's one thing for yamamoto to pull the trigger and say yeah create first air fleet it's quite another to hammer out all the operational details around how you're actually going to operate a group of aircraft carriers together because there's a lot of things that have got to be worked out. How are these ships going to steam together? In what formations? How many aircraft are they going to be putting up uh, when they make a launch cycle? Who's going to command those aircraft once they're in the air? Um, how are they going to be organized once they're in the air? What, what are they going to be carrying in terms of ordnance? Yada, 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 yada. So there's a lot of these details that had to be hammered out uh, during the latter part of 1941 while these ships are starting to exercise together. Um, and there was actually a fair amount of uh, kind of a tug of war going on because up to this point, just as in the U.S. Navy, um, it was the carrier captains themselves who were making decisions around air group composition and that sort of thing. But Commander Genda had been put in charge of uh, uh, First Air Fleet as the staff air officer. So there was a, a force commander, Admiral Nagumo, who you've undoubtedly heard of, um, and Genda becomes his right-hand man for air power. Genda starts ramming things down the carrier skipper's throats, and he has his way because he is, you know, the right-hand man of, of the task force commander. But what eventually gets hammered out uh, during the summer of 41 in the fall is that when we launch aircraft, we're going to put them up in what are called deck load strikes. We want to get these aircraft up in the air as quickly as possible, so we're only going to launch a package of aircraft that fit conveniently on the flight deck. We're not going to launch a bunch and then bring up an, another set from the hangar decks and then launch those right afterwards. Um, we're just going to do one you know, package right off of the deck, so that's a deck load strike. And furthermore, um, they start thinking of carrier divisions not as administrative units but as tactical units, and so the, the sort of standard uh, MO for them at this at this point becomes we'll use one carrier division uh, to put up a group of dive bombers. So both Akagi and Kaga, for instance, will launch their dive bombers along with a package of fighters as escorts. And then carrier division two will provide uh, the torpedo bombers uh, from both flight decks along with their fighter complement as well. And once all four of those deck load strikes are up together, They'll organize that into a single, cohesive, combined arms package containing dive bombers, torpedo bombers, um, and fighter escorts that will go off under one commander, usually the senior air, uh, air commander from whichever carrier launched their package. Uh, and that's how they organize their, um, their strikes. So while they're doing this, of course, there's a lot of Pearl Harbor specific training that's going on as well. Um, how do we attack uh, an anchorage like Pearl Harbor that is relatively shallow waters? Um, how are we going to suppress American air power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So the overall impression you need to take away is that the capabilities of Kido Butai are morphing constantly, almost overnight, because the Japanese are trying to solve all of these tactical problems and they're doing it very, very quickly. And the Allied navies, of course, have no idea that this is going on because neither the U.S. Navy or the Royal Navy has made the conceptual leap to say, what if we operate our carriers in a group? We're still thinking in penny packets. So think about how difficult this is from an intelligence standpoint. If you're an intel officer operating for the U.S. Navy, and your own Navy hasn't made this conceptual leap to multi-carrier operations, how are you going to be able to um, decipher this riddle and make predictions to your superiors saying, hey, you know, the Japanese could actually really do a number on us. And that is one of the reasons why Pearl Harbor comes as such a shock, because the U.S. Navy had absolutely no idea of the level of capability that the Japanese had at this point. Um, and it really was sort of a revolutionary thing. So, uh, as I said, it, it's a truly revolutionary force. By this point in time, uh, the Japanese Navy has something that no other Navy in the world has. They've got a group of big, fast carriers. All of those carriers are uh, sporting big air groups. They've got good aircraft in all of the major slots. Fighter, they're using the Zero, of course. Torpedo Bomber, they're using the Cape. 
and dive bombers. They got the Val. All of those are good modern aircraft. They've got very well trained aviators, and they've got this playbook now that is it's still thin, but it's workable, and they can put all of these assets together uh, and start start doing things. You know, so. At this point in time, no other Navy had the capability of doing something like a Pearl Harbor, you know, transiting all the way across the Pacific, bringing 300-plus aircraft to the battlefield. That was something that, that was beyond the ken of either the Royal or the U.S. Navy. And in fact, uh, the first time the U.S. Navy uh, replicated an operation of this sophistication, I would say, uh, was probably the strikes against Truck in February 1944, a full you know two years down the road, two years plus. So I, I look at the the Japanese carrier force and I kind of think of them as being the the naval equivalent of the Panzer Division. It's it's a really revolutionary animal and nobody else has got anything like it. So now let's take a quick look at the attack plan itself. And I'm going to draw heavily here from my friend Alan Zim's book, uh, Attack on Pearl Harbor, Strategy, Combat, Myths, and Deceptions. Alan is a former naval planner himself, and his book is by far the most detailed look at the nuts and bolts of how they put together this attack, and then how that attack uh, actually measured up uh, after the fact. So if any of you really want to dive into it. It's a very readable account, uh, but if you want the details on how they plan this thing, this is your book. The basic uh, scheme is that we are going to transit with our six carrier task force from Hitokapu Bay up in the Cure Isles, um, and we're going to go across the breadth of the northern Pacific, staying well out of the shipping lane so that we're not going to be detected. And then on 3rd December, we're going to turn south and make a high-speed run uh, down to Pearl Harbor, launch our attack, and then transit back home. If you take a look at the uh, uh, the attack itself, it's going to come in two big waves. The first wave has got a package of level bombers that are going to be going after uh, Battleship Row at Pearl Harbor. There's a package of dive bombers, most of which are designated for um, threat suppression of the American airfields, particularly Wheeler and Hickam. Uh, there's a package of torpedo bombers that are going to be going after uh, naval anchorage targets uh, in uh, Pearl Harbor itself, and then there's a big fighter escort group that's going along with all of them, not only to uh, provide escort, but also to strafe enemy airfields and so forth. The second wave will be coming about an hour afterwards. Um, that has a big package of level bombers, which are going to be doing follow-up strikes against some of the airfields, particularly Kaneohe Bay. Um, there's a big group of dive bombers that are going to be going after any um, naval targets that are left in Pearl Harbor itself that haven't been addressed in the first wave, and then another fighter package. And look at not only um, how the Japanese are attacking the naval anchorage itself, but they are going to go after every airfield on this island. So. Some people look at the British attack at Taranto and say, well, you know, Taranto was really the first real carrier attack. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's fine. But Taranto was one British carrier launching two dozen aircraft that attacked in the middle of the night because they knew they couldn't stand up to Italian air power in the day. Um, the Japanese are coming, and they're not only going to attack the naval anchorage, they're going to destroy every airfield on this island and shut down American air power completely. So, you know, just the scale and sophistication of this attack is, is an order of magnitude uh, greater than anything the British had, had thought of doing back at Toronto. The main weapons that are going to be used here are uh, the Type 91 torpedo, which is going to be used against uh, battleships that are on the outboard row in uh, Battleship Row and also aircraft carriers. And famously, of course, these have been fitted with our uh, wooden fins that help deflect the momentum of the torpedo striking the water so that the torpedo does not dive too deeply into the water uh, and thereby hit the bottom. So we're going to use the torpedoes for those sorts of targets. Um, the Japanese have developed a, a special heavy armor-piercing bomb. They've taken a 16-inch naval shell and machined down uh, the rear sections of it to turn it into more of a teardrop shape, put some tail fins on it, and fused it, and turned this shell into a very heavy armor-piercing bomb that can be used against battleships that have heavy deck armor. So those are going to be used by the level bombers that are coming over Battleship Row. And then finally, the dive bombers are carrying uh, 250 kilogram 
general purpose bombs. These weapons cannot penetrate heavy deck armor like a battleship has, but they're very useful against softer targets like cruisers and destroyers and, of course, airfields and that sort of thing. So that is what we've got in terms of ordnance on these aircraft. So this is a schematic of Pearl Harbor uh, just before the attack at 0755. You can see Ford Island in the middle. You see Battleship Row just over to the east of Ford Island, and then... Um, the aircraft carriers, had they been there, would have been parked over um, on this side of Ford Island. The attack plan is that we're going to deliver a group of torpedo attacks against the aircraft carrier targets, uh, designated here by the red arrows, and then we're also going to use a group of uh, torpedo planes to go after the battleship row, uh, which are designated by the purple arrows. And I think you can probably see one of the problems just right off the bat. This is incredibly complex and if you are a torpedo plane pilot you know the last thing you want to be doing uh, when you're lining up your own attack run is to see one of your compatriots zipping across your windshield while he's doing his so uh, there was some uh, this is very uh, over optimistic in terms of how they were going to be able to execute this attack and in point of fact when push came to shove and the actual attack went down what you see happening is that the torpedo planes kind of got funnelized um, into two or three main attack vectors going against uh, Ford Island from both sides. And in particular, um, down here in the South Lock, the torpedo planes that were aimed against uh, Battleship Row end up coming up the South Lock. And the reason for that is uh, over here on this little peninsula uh, where the supply base is, where a lot of them were supposed to line up their attack runs. What would have happened is the torpedo planes would have had to come in on the deck, pop up over that peninsula, and then pop right back down onto the deck again. There's thermals and stuff that happen because of that peninsula, and when these guys go back down onto the deck to line up their run against the battleships, they literally are only going to have like four or five seconds to get to the correct altitude at the correct speed and line up their target. So, not too surprisingly, what ended up happening is that most of the pilots um, sort of paraded uh, up here past the southeast lock and then fanned out to go and hit their targets against Battleship Row. That had the effect of parading them past a lot of our anti-aircraft guns, particularly on the destroyer Bagley here, um, and that caused them some pretty heavy casualties as a result. So if we take a look at uh, the ordinance that was actually delivered, uh, this slide shows you the, uh, the number of hits that were delivered against various vessels. The vessels in red are ending up sunk. Um, Oklahoma and West Virginia in particular collect extremely heavy damage, uh, overkill, frankly, for, for what would have taken them out. And then if we look at now the high-level bombers, the high-level bombers are coming with those heavy 16-inch uh, naval shells, and they are parading from southwest um, to northeast across uh, Battleship Row and dropping their weapons uh, along the length of that run. So if you take a look at the number of uh, hits from the high-level bombs, uh, there's a total of 10. Uh, the most famous victim, of course, being uh, the Arizona, which is struck by one of these bombs on her, uh, her starboard um, uh, quarterdeck and uh, blown to smithereens. Um, but there were actually 10 hits uh, with all of these weapons. Unfortunately for the Japanese, uh, a number of the bombs had dud fuses, and so they didn't get the results that they might have gotten otherwise. So total together of both uh, torpedo hits and AP bomb hits is illustrated here. And the result is that they sink uh, four battleships uh, outright. Uh, the target ship Utah doesn't really count as a battleship because it was inactivated. But uh, as you can see, they delivered very heavy damage against battleship Rome. Then uh, during the second wave, our dive bombers come in to do their thing. And by this time, you can see the battleship Nevada here has moved from its position at the end of Battleship Row, has gotten up uh, steam, and has been moving down the channel here and is going to try to make it to the ocean. She had taken a torpedo hit earlier, um, and that's actually what ends up sinking her. But this big, juicy, moving target attracts an outsized um, helping of dive bomber goodness, if you will. Um, Commander Igusa, who uh, from Soryu is the dive bomber leader for this attack, uh, assigned, I think, as many as 24 of his aircraft to go after Nevada, and she eventually beaches herself here on Hospital Point. 
So this is a schematic then of the total number of bomb hits that are delivered throughout the anchorage. Um, there are some other minor damage that's done to the battleship Pennsylvania over here in the dry dock, and the two destroyers ahead of her are sunk. Um, so, you know, on the face of it, that's a lot of damage, right? Pretty spectacular results. But in actuality, it was not nearly as good as it might have been. The torpedoes did pretty well. They got about a 48% uh, hit ratio, which is, you know, in live fire conditions, that's, that's pretty darn good. Um, but they were sort of wasted some of those weapons against Oklahoma and, and West Virginia. Three or four torpedoes would have done plenty of damage to sink those ships. Um, and, you know, they collected five and seven apiece. If you look at the AP bombs, uh, they only got a 20% uh, hit rate, although they did destroy the Arizona. Um, they got a lot of dud fuses, and so the, the truth of the matter is that if they had gotten a little luckier, um, some of the inboard battleships like Tennessee and Maryland might have ended up in the same state that Arizona was. So um, not a very good hit rate, but a, but a pretty good uh, damage rate as a result of those weapons. The real problem happens in the dive bomber attacks. Um, the dive bombers were turning in results before the war of about an 80% hit ratio, and you can see here they only delivered about a 20% uh, rate. And they also really misallocated the usage of those weapons. Um, they should never have gone after the Nevada with their dive bombers. It was a mistake because uh, the GP bombs didn't have the, the hitting power to get through the deck armor on those ships. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot of topside damage done, but it was relatively superficial. It had nothing to do with why uh, Nevada uh, eventually had to beat yourself. So if you kind of go back and say, well, how could I have reallocated those weapons and gotten better results? 50 more torpedoes rather than 50 uh, heavy AP bombs might have gotten you a much better hit ratio because there's plenty of ships out in the anchorage uh, ways out there, you know, destroyers and tenders and cruisers and whatnot that could have been taken out with those torpedoes. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the weapon matching with the GP weapons on the dive bombers was very poor. Bad accuracy. They should not have gone after Nevada um, with those weapons. And in particular, if you take a look here, again, at the southeast lock, this is the Navy, uh, the supply yard is up here, battleship row is up this way. Well, there's this whole agglomeration of cruisers that were sitting in the docks here. New Orleans, San Francisco, St. Louis, Honolulu, all of these were big, modern um, cruisers. San Fran uh, and New Orleans both are going to have uh, quite a role um, in the early war battles. So... And given the, the concentration of targets here, you know, a Japanese dive bomber could have hardly helped dropping a weapon and hitting something of value. Um, but these ships went away unscathed as a result of this attack. So that was not as well done as it might have been. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about the fuel tank attack. And down through the years, this has been bandied about as being an enormous blunder on the part of the Japanese, that they should have come back and hit these fuel tanks um, because if they had done so, you know, the results might have been uh, that Pearl Harbor would not have been useful as a, as a naval base. It turns out that that's not actually true, but in any case, this has been sort of pumped up into one of the great lost opportunities of the war. And this myth comes down to us from the movie Tora Tora Tora, and I'm sure that a number of you have seen this movie and you've seen this sequence of, of clips at the end. Um, it's after the attack. Uh, Commander Fuchida, who is the, uh, the strike leader, lands his airplane on the Akagi and, you know, gets out of the cockpit, gets out and is talking to the maintenance guys. He's like, you know, what's going on here? Why isn't the, the next wave getting ready to take off? And he's told that, you know, there's not going to be an, another wave. And he, he you know, incredulously looks up at the at Akagi's bridge, and there's his buddy Genda up on the bridge. And Genda looks at him and goes over and has a discussion with Admiral Nagumo. And Genda says, you know, we've got to go back and hit these guys again. They're, they're ripe for a follow-up strike. Uh, you know, we should be going after the American carriers, locate them and find them and, you know, destroy them and, and take out their dry docks. At which point Nagumo says, Chigao, you're wrong. Um, our mission has been completely accomplished. We've sunk the battleships that we need to sink, and furthermore, we're at the beginning of what is going to be a very long war, and I don't want to expose this very important carrier force to undue risk. 
And so the flags get hoisted on Akagi's bridge, and Fuchida is left incredulous on the flight deck. The only problem with this particular sequence of events is that they never happened at all. And in fact, um, there was never any sort of a discussion on the Japanese carrier uh, Akagi between Fuchida, Genda, and Nagumo or anybody um, where they were even debating the issue of going back and making another attack against the Americans aimed at the logistics facilities. And this myth originates with Fuchida himself, who was a very important author uh, after the war. He wrote a book called Midway, the Battle that Doomed Japan. Um, that became sort of the core Japanese source work for the Battle of Midway. He also becomes um, a Christian missionary and spends a lot of time in America and is, is kind of a rock star over here, at least from you know the Pearl Harbor and Midway standpoint. Does TV shows, he was you know on, on various TV shows and, and whatnot. Unfortunately, he's peddling a, a complete set of lies. It's, it's, a, it's a war story, and it's one of only many war stories that Fuchida tells. Um, uh, he peddles war stories about Midway and, and all sorts of other things as well, but the one about Pearl Harbor, I think, is probably the most pernicious of all. So why is this baloney? Why did the Japanese never have any intention of going back and attacking our um, our fuel facilities? Well, the first piece of evidence that you can drag out is the targeting order that were promulgated down from Admiral Yamamoto and his planning staff to Admiral Nagumo. And so if you take a look at these set of orders, you can see here that the priorities are land-based air power at the top of the list. And that may be surprising to some people, but again, the Japanese were extremely concerned about um, exposing their force to what they knew were uh, large numbers of American aircraft that were based on Oahu. That's why the attack plan is as sophisticated as it is, because we want to crush the air power that's on Oahu and get rid of those aircraft so that they can't come out and hit our aircraft carriers. So land-based air power, then of course aircraft carriers, which were not present uh, at Pearl Harbor, and then battleships, cruisers and other warships, yada, yada, yada. And down at the bottom of the list, you see shore installations and land facilities. So that was, you know, where... Um, logistics was in the in the hierarchy of their attack. And Americans may look at that and say, well, you know, that's crazy. What, what, why, why didn't they think that logistics were important? Well, the, the Japanese Navy was uh, a, very much an adherent to the theories of Alfred Thayer Mahan. And some of you may be familiar with him. He was the leading um, naval theorist around the turn of the century. Mahan's whole shtick was the way to gain sea power is to find the main force of the enemy and destroy it, um, which in that time meant, of course, sinking their battle line. So in the Japanese Navy, if you're planning an operation and you're using assets that are not being um, directly targeted to get rid of enemy warships, you're wasting those assets. Okay, So logistics wasn't even on the radar screen. It wasn't something that they felt was even important, and that's reflected here in the targeting orders that you see. As it turns out, um, Fuchida himself in 1945 was asked this question point blank by um, the interviewers for the United States Strategic Bombing Survey. They went into Japan, as they did in Germany, and interrogated lots of military uh, officials, and they were basically looking for the effects of air power on the war. But anyway, one of the USBUS, uh, that's what we call it in the field, USBUS, U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, one of the USBUS interrogators asked Fuchida point blank in October 1945, you know, why didn't you guys go back and hit us again? And Fuchida's answer in 1945 is, well, we knew we'd sunk four of your battleships, and that met... Uh, the level of satisfaction for our targeting orders. You know, Yamamoto said if we could sink four, four battleships, the operation's a winner. You know, we've done what we've set out to do. So we had done that. We did not know how badly we had damaged your air power on Oahu, um, and we couldn't find your aircraft carriers. And so in light of all of those factors, we decided good enough, and we went home. However, by 1963, his story has completely morphed. And so if you read Gordon Prang's book, At Dawn We Slept, which is, you know, by far the biggest selling Pearl Harbor book uh, that's ever been written, 
this description comes out, that as Fuchida is flying back to Akagi after the attack, his mind is racing with thoughts of a second assault that same afternoon, um, mentally earmarking for destruction in the vast fuel tank farms and blah, 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 blah. Understand that if Fuchida was actually thinking these things in 1941, it represented not only a complete renunciation of the targeting orders that Yamamoto has specifically given out to this force for this attack, but it also represents nothing less than the total renunciation of 20 years worth of naval training and indoctrination by the part of the Japanese Navy. So for him to have somehow made this, you know, conceptual aha moment that, oh, it's the logistics facilities that are really the important stuff that we have to go off, it's, it's a bunch of baloney. Um, so, and the reason, uh, another reason, no, that it's a bunch of baloney is from Genda himself, because Genda also wrote a book after the war, and he specifically points out that he is aware that in uh, Prang's book, Tora, 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 which is sort of the present predecessor to A Dawn We Slept. Um, you know, there was supposed to have been this fierce argument on the Bridge of Akagi. I was on the Bridge of Akagi all day, gentlemen, and nothing like that ever happened. Um, I didn't make a proposal like that to Nagumo, and in fact, he states that he had known all along. Uh, he had sort of broached the topic to Nagumo at the beginning of the foray, but Nagumo had huddled up with uh, his right-hand man, um, Kusaka, his chief of staff, and they had said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to deliver one attack, and then we're going to go home. So um, it's pretty clear from the guy who was actually on the bridge of Akagi that Fuchida's story is just that. It's a fable. So to wrap things up, um, I would say that the conventional mythos around Pearl Harbor having been brilliantly conceived and brilliantly executed requires a little bit of a backing off. It, it was a, a really bold, conceptual attack, and it was certainly delivered with a great deal of elan, um, but they delivered results that were kind of suboptimal, and frankly, the Japanese left a lot of stuff on the table that they could have had in, in the form of cruisers they could have sunk and, and even destroyers and submarines and that sort of thing had they allocated their weapons uh, in, a, in a more... Uh, rational fashion. Um, on the other hand, you know, they did accomplish their mission. They put the Pacific Fleet uh, out of action. We were in no position to, say, uh, steam to the rescue of the Philippines and save the garrison that was trapped there and that was going to go down um, and be captured in, in April and May of 1941. So Yamamoto accomplished his mission. He crushed the air power on Oahu. Um, and he demonstrated a level of capability that no other navy in the world at this point had. You know, they brought six carriers across the width of the Pacific, hundreds of airplanes. They didn't attack in the middle of the night. They attacked in broad daylight, and they crushed, crushed a major American naval base. That was um, a pretty amazing accomplishment for uh, naval warfare at that point in time. So I would argue that, that you can look at this attack and say, yeah, it was flawed, but it was also revolutionary. And that is what I have for you uh, this morning. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. All right, awesome. And actually, here's where I come back in. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for that overview. Um, if you could read through some of that Q&A, you'll see some people saying, like, oh, this is so good, I, don't even, like, I can't even think of questions because I'm so captivated. So, um, But a few did come through, and I'm going to, as I said, ask on uh, their behalf. And folks, this is also still a time, if you still have more questions, pop them on in that Q&A area because uh, we'll, we'll take them for kind of the rest of the time today if that works for you, Jonathan. Is that good? You bet. All right, cool. All right, so um, the first I, the first couple questions I received were actually about intelligence. So from Michael Last, he asks, in regards to the intel about the lack of honest and complete transfer of information from Washington, D.C., can you talk about, you know, that communication? Right. Um... And I'm just going to step right back and say I am not a huge student of the cryptologic efforts uh, that went along. And, and Pearl Harbor, of course, has had its more than its share of conspiracy theories down through the years. And, and some of that is, is honest questioning, too. It doesn't have necessarily have to be a conspiracy theory. But um, was Washington sending the information that needed to be sent out to Oahu, and there's a lot of 
kind of contending theories on that. Um, and I don't actually know, when you say honest information, what specifically are you talking about? I mean, there had been a war warning order that had gone out to both Admiral Kimmel and General Short that had said, you should consider yourselves on a war footing. But there's been a lot of controversy about, well, what does that actually mean? And how should they have implemented those orders um, in order to protect uh, their commands? It is clear, I, I've seen at least a couple of different pieces of evidence that the Americans did have in mind that the Japanese could potentially come here with an aircraft carrier and do a raid. But it, again, and, and this had been done in one of our war games uh, back in the 1930s, the Lexington had come in and, and done a fake raid against Pearl Harbor. So it was certainly not beyond the realm of possibility that a raid could have happened. But understand that our conception of what a raid meant was one carrier shows up, maybe does a single you know, sortie, we have to mess around with 60 planes or something like that, and then it's over. We had no conception of the magnitude of firepower that the Japanese could bring uh, to the party. And in fact, if you look at the congressional hearings later on down the road, um, one of the individuals that they interviewed was uh, Admiral Kimmel's uh, chief of air and another admiral, and they and they were asking him, you know, what's going on here? And this this guy answered, and I paraphrase, um, you know, it's obvious that we had no conception of the sophistication and capabilities that the Japanese had. This was a very undervalued opponent. A lot of people at this point in time thought that the Japanese couldn't even fly fighter planes, that they were nearsighted, you know. It, so I, I think there's a combination of factors going on here, and there's probably no one simple answer. But I don't actually think that there was any sort of a conspiracy from Washington to withhold information uh, to the tactical commands. I think what's going on is that people just really didn't have a good idea of what the Japanese were capable of. All right, that's that's awesome. Um, we have actually a few questions coming in about the U.S. carriers. First, simply, why were the U.S. carriers not at port? And that comes from Michael and Gary. And then the second one from Evan, a, a follow-up to that, um, he asked about how did the Japanese intelligence operations fail so dramatically regarding the carriers not being there? The Japanese actually were aware. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Let me see if I can. Yeah, another two-parter. <laughs> Lexington at this moment in time was actually um, starting to starting a run to wake to deliver some aircraft to that garrison. Uh, Enterprise was performing exercises to the south of Hawaii and was actually scheduled to be uh, in port but it had run into some rough weather and while they were refueling her escorts um, they, they couldn't get all the fueling done in time, and so that delayed her getting back in port. She was actually relatively near at hand, and it's conceivable that if the Japanese had been bold and gone south of the islands and taken a look, they might have found Enterprise. But another reason that this third uh, attack wave myth is a myth is that you've got to recall the Japanese have done this very high-speed run down to the south to attack Pearl Harbor their destroyers are already kind of running low on fuel oil. And this was another consideration that Nagumo had in mind. He's like, you know, if I get into some sort of a uh, protracted naval battle here, um, my destroyer escorts are going to run out of oil. So they were hamstrung by logistical considerations as well. In terms of the intel failure on the Japanese side, um, they were actually aware that the American carriers were not there. Of course, they didn't have any control over the American carriers' movements, but they had sent messages back. Um, they had a spy. And in fact, those of you who are, are going to be on the tour um, in December, we're going to go to the Japanese tea house where this spy hung out. And there was a, there's a telescope up in this tea house where you can see the entire harbor. And so this dude was up there, um, you know, sending back intel reports based on what he could see. And so the Japanese actually did have information in hand that, you know, there aren't any carriers in the Anchorage uh, as of last night. And they actually sent out some scouting planes to look at some of the other alternate Anchorages where they knew uh, the Americans sometimes hung out and looked for the carriers there. They were not there. So it wasn't, it wasn't a failure. It was a disappointment is kind of what it comes down to. They knew that they weren't going to get them. They were hoping against hope that when they showed up at the anchorage that maybe somebody pulled in in the morning, but that's not what they got. 
That's really interesting. Actually, I hadn't, hadn't heard that part of the story either. Um, now, uh, you mentioned logistics in your, in your last response. And so actually, we did have a, a question about that from David Holloway. He said, can you comment on the Japanese fleet logistic prep for um, just crossing the Pacific? That's kind of a really difficult task. And can you comment a bit yeah. more on the process of that? Yeah, and I'm a logistics nerd, so I'm really into that kind of stuff. Um, and actually, if you want to read, uh, the best account for that is in Gordon Prang's book, um, The Pearl Harbor Papers. There is an account there that was written by one of the Japanese destroyer captains that was in the task force, and he talks about how they made it all the way across the Pacific and back. Um, at this point in time, the whole uh, technique of underway refueling was also wild, wild west. And the U.S. Navy had started developing this kind of stuff. Um, and the Japanese actually started doing the same thing very, very close to the attack itself. And so, and I, I don't know that we have an indication as to whether or not they could do side-by-side -side refueling at this point. They eventually did. Typically, the technique at this point was they got a big ship like a battleship. They would run an oil line across the bow of the battleship up to the stern of the destroyer. Um, it's a much less efficient way of doing things, and it's more prone to tension, breaking the lines, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, they could do it. That's the material point, and that is how they uh, supplied the smaller uh, warships with fuel. They also had an oiler group that went with the task force up until about December 3rd or 4th, and then they topped off everybody's fuel tanks, and the oiler group kind of peeled off and waited for them there in the North Pacific. Uh, Kido Butai goes down, does its thing, comes back up to the oiler group, refuels again, and that's and then they head back home. So um, they were doing underway uh, replenishment. Um, the carriers, uh, famously again in Tora Tora Tora, um, had extra fuel oil on them, particularly Soryu and Hiryu, which had greedier uh, fuel pan plants than Kaga and Akagi. But um, it, I, I can't remember if all four of them did. I know that Soryu and Hiryu did. They were putting spare fuel oil in drums in the companionways of uh, these ships um, to be able to top off uh, the, the fuel tanks as they made their way home because yeah this was this was real stretch to get all the way across the Pacific and actually hit us. Okay, the next one comes from uh, Bill O'Connell. He says, "Where was, if anywhere, the submarine docks? Um, is that another myth about mistakes?" Um, they certainly could have hit the submarine docks. Um, although again, if you look at the targeting lists, by the time we got through the attack. We're barely down into item number, you know, three and a half of, of the targeting list. And so um, I think if you were actually going to go back and do a third strike, they would have concentrated on those heavy cruisers that were left um, and then start, you know, chewing their way through the destroyers and so forth. Um, you're right, though, in pointing out that with the battleships out of the picture, from an offensive standpoint, the only assets that the U.S. Navy had left to them at this point were the aircraft carriers and the submarines. The cruisers weren't going to go out and operate by themselves, and in fact, they were mostly being used as, uh, at this point as carrier escorts. So um, you can make an argument that attacking the submarine base would have been a pretty important contribution to the Japanese war effort. On the other hand, you can make a counter-argument that says, well, yeah, but given that American torpedoes at this point in the war were just dreadful and were suffering from all sorts of exploder issues and very, very poor reliability, whether I attack the submarine base or not is really sort of irrelevant because their torpedoes don't work anyway. So there you have it. <laughs> I, like, I like it, both sides. Um, all right, uh, we've got an interesting question from Mike here. He says, you know, obviously we're saying that the attack – um, plan w and execution was flawed. Not this. Not you know. That's kind of right. one part of the myth. Um, but he said, "Isn't that our kind of modern day view? Like hindsight, of course, is twenty twenty. And as you mentioned, you know, we didn't anticipate Japan being absolutely. capable of that. What, what do you say to that?" No, you're absolutely right. And you know, any book like Alan Zim's book or or you know my talk today, yeah, sure, I'm operating with with perfect 2020 hindsight. And you're absolutely right in pointing that out. The Japanese had no way of knowing um, that their dive bombers, for instance, weren't going to perform as as well as they might have. Um, 
they didn't know that there weren't going to be any anti-torpedo nets out board of those battleships. And so you can say, well, they were right then to hedge their bets by putting a group of level bombers in. Um, even those weapons, even though those weapons uh, recorded a lower hit percentage, um, if they had come in with an all torpedo package and then found that the Americans had taken different precautions, they might have been completely boogered as far as torpedoes were concerned. So, um, no, you're 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 quite correct. I'm just all I'm trying to point out is that there were some flaws in the actual execution, and you can certainly say. Um, as far as the dive bombers going after Nevada is concerned, that was ill-considered. Um, Commander Agusa was the leading dive bomber expert in the Japanese Navy. He knew full well that a 250-kilogram GP bomb is not going through four inches of armored steel. So I think it, it's clear that he just got carried away in the heat of the moment. Here's this big, juicy target. Man, we got to hit that sucker um, and instead of using those weapons in a more intelligent fashion uh, around the anchorage. Interesting. All right. And then um, we'll, we're going to take it a little bit away from Pearl Harbor. Evan is asking, how do you assess the preparedness and wake at the Philippines and the Philippines um, comparatively to Pearl Harbor? You know, um, I'm not a big expert on wake, although if you look at the um, casualties that we inflicted on their first, on the Japanese first round uh, invasion attempt, uh, you know, we really bloodied their nose. We sank two of their destroyers outright and forced them to, you know, call it off. In fact, if you, you may have seen on the, the map that I had earlier um, in the presentation, and maybe I can pop back to this all the way back to Cheetah. <laughs> go. Wait. Too far. <laughs> there we go. Ooh. Here we go. Um, on 16 December, Carrier Division 2, on its way back to Japan, is detached from Kitobutai and sent down to Wake Island to do the second round invasion because the Japanese had lost so badly the first time around. The bottom line is, though, that, you know, um, everybody on the American side of the pond before the war is screaming for assets. Everybody wants more of everything and they want it right now because they're concerned that if the Japanese do attack that they have not got the hardware uh, to repulse it. And, you know, I hate to say it, but an island like Wake, yes, it's important, but everything was important at this point in time. And I don't really, you know, there's no way to really beef up that garrison on this tiny little island to the point where it can resist uh, a carrier attack from multiple groups of Japanese carriers. It's just, it's not in the cards. So no matter what happens, Wake is going down. I mean, there's just no way to get around that. And indeed, if you kind of look through the just the whole Pacific Basin and the Allied position as a whole, not just the American position, but the Dutch and the British as well, we were just ready to be torn to shreds. And that's exactly what happened to us in the first four or five months of this war. With regards to the Philippines, I have a lot of opinions about that. Um, and you, you know, we should sit down over a beer sometime and talk about, you know, what do I think of MacArthur and how well he, or poorly, did he execute um, the defense on the Philippines? What's kind of happening at a political level, though, is that during the lead up to the war, um, Washington has got this brand new weapon system called the B-17. And this bomber, a lot of people don't know this, but the B-17 was designed as a naval attack weapon. It was designed to go after warships. It was miserably ineffective in that role, but nobody knew that at the time. So we're pumping B-17s into the Philippines as a counterweight to the attack that we think may be coming up. And meanwhile, MacArthur is sending all these cheery reports back to Washington saying, oh, the Philippine army is great. They're mobilizing really well, and I'm absolutely certain we can defend this place, and blah, 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 blah. And, of course, you know, the Japanese get ashore in Lingai and Gulf and, and later on in December and just absolutely kick the Philippine army to the curb. So there was a lot of wishful thinking going on between um, Washington and MacArthur, and it was kind of this negative feedback loop, really. You know, they were both... I'm telling you, telling Washington what they want to hear, and Washington's telling me what they want to hear, and you know everybody's thinking hunky peachy, and then you know when push <laughs> comes to shove, you know that's the end of that. So um, I don't think the Philippines had any real chance in long term of being viable. Do I think that we could have run the campaign in Luzon more competently and actually bloodied 
uh, Japanese 14th Army a little bit more? Absolutely. But that's not the time or place for discussing that. Yeah, maybe at uh, 501 today, since it is a Friday, we'll all meet at whatever bar you designate in uh, uh, Minnesota, and we'll all, we'll all continue this discussion. Um, okay, I have a, we've got about four minutes left till we're at uh, noon Central Time. I've got a kind of long question from Michael Brewer that it came in the beginning that I want to make sure I ask you. He says, uh, my dad, a gunnery sergeant on the USS Chicago, related a very interesting story that I've not, never read about. He said that the Japanese bombed Pearl. The ships remaining of the fleet sailed around Japanese islands with known spotters, and at night they would change ships, ship numbers, and paint seams to create a deception that the U.S. had many more ships in the Pacific. Have you heard of this? I have never heard of that. <laughs> never. And that strikes me. I'll just, I'll just say I'm, I've got my skeptical hat on, yeah. even though I'm yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that huh? No, that's fascinating, and I'd I'd actually like to hear hear more about that. But all right, well maybe right he can join us for a beer right. too. <laughs> yeah. Interesting though. All right, um, let me see if I can uh, let's see find any other questions that we could maybe answer in uh, in our. Three minutes left. Okay, so Mike, another, we've got a lot of Mikes and Michaels joining us today. Did the aerial of the B-25s, or he put 29s in parentheses, affect the raid on Pearl? Oh, I think maybe he means the, the bombers coming in that day from, yeah, they were 17s, yeah. Um, no, that, that had no impact at all on the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese were kind of surprised to see them flying in, but as far as they were concerned, you know, it's just something else to shoot down. Um uh, there were actually some aircraft that came in from the Enterprise during the attack as well, and a number of them were shot down. So uh, the B-17s themselves had no real impact on the battle. All right. And actually, you know what? With that, that might be kind of a, a good time to close out. And I want I know you can't see everybody, but you can see in that Q&A, and of course you saw the chat in the beginning, um, how many interested folks that we have uh, here with us tuning in. So, John, and on behalf of me and everybody else virtually watching, we want to just give you a big r round of applause and a big thank you for joining us today um, to, to open up our Pearl Harbor webinar series. Thank you so much. I'd say, too, you know, if anybody wants to get a hold of me at my website, which is combinedfleet.com, and I'm just John P, J-O-N-P, at combinedfleet.com, um, I'm more than happy to yak with you offline on email. I enjoy that kind of stuff, so feel free to fire away. Cool. Thanks so much. Well, that's great. And I'm actually going to transfer us over into one last uh, little area of this room and actually go away on uh, camera, but I um, want to share with you a few other resources um, to kind of get you thinking about, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Of course, and I'm going to pause the video, or pause this PowerPoint here, please sign up for part two. Remember, this is a webinar series, and of course, we're doing this kind of right as we get closer and closer to the anniversary of December 7th. So today is Oct October 7th. Our next one is going to be, oh, let me go back to it. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Oh, now it's not letting me. Come on. Here's my first slide. There we go. Uh, our uh, is November 7th uh, with Captain Rick Jacobs. Actually, he's virtually attending today. So, Captain Jacobs, you're up next uh, to continue the story on the attack on Pearl Harbor. So, that will be Monday, November 7th of 2016. Same time, same place, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Central Time. Same place, obviously, the computer you're watching from right now. Uh, register at that link that you see right there. Uh, this program actually filled up. Uh, after one email announcement, so make sure you register now if you're interested. Um, and then I also want to share with you, let's kind of, and this will go in a loop so you'll see this link again, uh, the museum's resources related to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, five years ago, we put together a special exhibit called Infamy, December 1941, and you can check out that website uh, with related oral histories, interactive maps, um, and artifacts, and it's infamydecember1941.org. You can get your Pearl Harbor swag, of course, at the uh, museum store, and you can see the link to those things. And uh, lastly, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, Come to Pearl Harbor with us. Uh, our tour is December 1st through the 8th, of course, of this year to commemorate the 75th anniversary, and Jonathan will be there. There's uh, the link to a bit more information about that.
And um, if you look above the Q&A area, you see the web links there. And uh, you can find some additional links uh, there for your interest. And of course, one thing I definitely want to point out there is to purchase uh, Jonathan's book that we mentioned earlier, Shattered Sword. Um, and so that's a link directly to purchase that on our web store. All right, and I think I think that's it for announcements. Uh, please join us again uh, for the next installment of the series on November 7th. Then after that, it continues December 7th with our live commemoration here at the Museum of the Attack. And then on December 8th, curator uh, here, uh, Larry, will be joining us to talk about uh, some other parts of December 7th and December 8th, and we'll be talking about the Philippines and uh, Wake Island, so some topics that came up today. So we're going to do a full series on this very important date, a date that will live in infamy. So, all right, and with that, this is Chrissy at the National World War II Museum signing off. Everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much. Bye.